Welcome everyone. I hope you have your popcorn, your notebooks, you're ready to get started. Um, so thank you for joining us from wherever you are on Turtle Island and beyond. Um, there's a lot going on these days, uh, environmentally, socially, health-wise. So thank you for tuning in with us and spending some time with us. Um, a little bit of information on who we are. Um, so Chloe is from AWARE. Oops. Can you still hear me? Okay. <laughs> Um, we have a next slide coming up that kind of gives us a little bit of um, background information on who we are. Um, AWARE is, uh, stands for the Association of Whistler Area Residents for the Environment. Um, they've been working on conservation and climate um, actions in Whistler and the Sea to Sky since 1989. So um, please do visit their website, um, follow them on social media. They have many amazing programs um, for all ages and interests, but uh, we're very thankful that they have partnered with us on this event um, and on different events. Um, their dedication and energy for all things environmental is very inspiring and commendable. So we'd like to thank Claire um, and Natasha from AWARE to bring this event, uh, making it a success. Um, so my name is Jolene Patrick. I work with the Coast Cascades Grizzly Bear Initiative. Um, we are a non-profit, non-government organization striving to um, recover threatened and critically endangered um, grizzly bear species populations in southwest British Columbia. Um, we welcome you to join, um, look at our website, it's being revamped, so stay tuned for more um, updates on initiatives and programs that we have for threatened bears in southwest BC. Um, we would also very much like to thank the Grizzly Bear Foundation. Um, they, we had overwhelming interest for this online webinar, so it was through the Grizzly Bear Foundation that we were able to increase our capacity to let um, more of you join in. So um, thank you for, to the Grizzly Bear Foundation. Um, they, we now have, I think we have just over 425 were registered. Um, it is being recorded, so we can watch it at a later date. But um, grizzly bears are such an iconic species that, you know, in Canada and worldwide, um, it shows there it is a greater community um, that are just as interested and passionate as we are. All right, so for our outline, how, our, how it's gonna kind of fold out, we hopefully have your attention for 90 minutes. Um, this kind of event came through because, you know, when we do outreach activities, um, people would keep asking us, you know, the same questions about grizzly bears. Um, the importance of this species, um, it's ingrained, it, it's ties to the landscape is key for the health of our shared landscapes. So um, grizzly bears make headlines, um, but there's a lot of misleading information out there. So uh, who better to bring you those frequently asked questions than experts in the field of grizzly bear research? So with COVID, you know, restricting us in our homes, it's a great opportunity to expand um, our knowledge base. So thank you everybody who has submitted those questions to us. We will, as Claire said, try to cover as much as we can um, with a limited time. So we have organized it into categories. We have uh, grizzly bear biology and ecology, behavior, conflict avoidance, and grizzly bear research. Um, please note at the end, we will include um, a list of resources. So if your questions haven't been answered, um, there's a wealth of information out there um, and we're happy to provide those. Um, and also watch for audience polls. So there'll be a chance for you to participate. Um, we'll be posting questions to you as well. Those features are, should be on your screen, on the bottom of your screen. Um, and yeah, so the world is changing for humans, for wildlife alike, and you know, we're joining together, we're educating ourselves and what's happening locally in, in the greater global community um, so we can move forward collectively. So we are thankful you have joined us today. Um, and I would like to send well wishes and healing to everybody who are on the front line, standing up for our health, for our environment, and for justice. Um, I'd also like to welcome our panelists who are all independent scientists. Um, there are many accolades are, are too numerous to go over and extensive, but with combined decades of research, um, field work and contributions to the world of grizzly bear and helping us understanding um, and appreciate the life of grizzly bears. Um, we are very thankful that they have joined us today um, to get a closer look of science um, and nature. So we would like to welcome um, Dr. Lana Charnello, who joins us from the island, uh, Dr. M Bruce McClellan from kind of north of Whistler, 
um, Dr. Michael Proctor from the Kootenays and as well from the Kootenay region, um, new Dr. Michelle McClellan. So without further ado, I will pass it on to um, Executive Director of AWARE, uh, Claire Reddy, for, to start off our question and answer series. Thanks, Jolene. So um, as Jolene mentioned, there was, there was so many questions that we could have um, put into this session. So we are gonna try to fly through and cover as much as we can. Um, but we thought we'd start with a question for you, the audience. And so we're just gonna, in front of you on your screen, you should see a question pop up. Um, and we wanna know how many of you have seen a grizzly bear um, in person, in the wild, um, not in captivity. Um, so we're gonna launch that poll and we'll give you 60 seconds to answer it. So you should see it in front of you, click on the uh, yes or no. Should have got a countdown clock. <laughs> Okay, so we're still, we've still got lots of people going. 80% full. Okay, last few seconds. You snooze, you lose. Okay, we're ending it there. So 60% of people that are, we can share these results. So we've got on the, um, on this, on this session, 60% of people have seen a grizzly bear, 40% have not. So Scientists, we know what we're uh, we know what we're um, what we're uh, who, who are who are talking to on the other side of this uh, this vacuous uh, technological um, call, <laughs> so uh, which is great. So um, okay, so we're going to start with a little bit of framing here. So um, I'm going to start with inviting Bruce to maybe give us a little bit of an update around how um, how bears are doing. So Bruce is a now retired government researcher and um, you know got, has got asked this question a lot so um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with that Bruce if you don't mind. Do you mute? Yeah that, that is the question that I've been asked more than any other over my long career with bears. Uh, it's so Bruce how are the bears doing? And uh, and I'll try to put it you know uh, 250, 280 years of how bears are doing into about five minutes. Uh, generally, uh, as most of us know, they did very, very, very poorly for about 270 years uh, in North and Western North America. They were more or less extirpated from the lower 48 states. Uh, a couple of small populations remained in Yellowstone, Northern Mon and in Mon Northern Montana and right along the Canadian border, a tiny one there. Uh, they were extirpated across the prairies, uh, and in BC they were greatly reduced. Uh, the uh, they weren't they didn't get quite as hammered at the distribution in BC largely because it's fairly inhospitable for humans. But you know the same people that were uh, wiping them out in the lower 48, a lot of them moved north. I mean, in 1858, 30,000 of the gold miners from California moved to the Caribou or, and the Fraser to mine gold, so same type of people. Uh, when I started doing grizzly bear research in the 1970s, I spoke to lots of old timers who are long gone now, because that was a long time of 40 some odd years ago. and Many of them told me stories of killing many bears in the 30s and 40s. Two guys I remember well told me they killed so many bears, they and their crews, whether they were mining crews or logging crews, that two of these guys told me they thought they were going to kill them all. And even when I started in the 70s in the Flathead Valley, uh, a guy told me that about eight years before I was there, they killed you know, five bears in the, the garbage dump that was 100 feet from the logging camp right in my study area. And when I began working there, the log, little logging camps had garbage dumps 100 feet from their camp and threw garbage there. I, I didn't know that they shot any bears in that first little bit. We, we certainly shut that down really quick. So anyway, bear numbers were greatly depressed until about the mid 70s. Things started changing a lot in the late 60s and early 70s and particularly because the U.S. Uh, put them on, the, on their endangered species list in 1975. The mentality of people changed. They started valuing bears better. It wasn't the, the knee-jerk reaction to shoot every bear you saw. Um, uh, the population I started working on in the 70s was one that uh, I started there because it was thought to be threatened. It was thought to be almost gone. I mean, Andy Russell, who hopefully some of you have heard about, Andy, who that was grizzly country, the Flathead Valley where he had his guiding territory. 
he uh, thought we were down to 15 bears. So anyway, I started working there and yeah, there were few bears back then. But over the first 20 years that I worked in that valley, they, they went up a lot. I mean, they were rebounding after being depressed. And uh, they more or less double, almost tripled in the first 20 years before reaching some kind of a carrying capacity. And they've kind of gone up and down for the next uh, 20 some odd years. I've worked there for, this will be my 43rd field season in that steady area. Uh, further to the, I'm just going to go through the, the southern fringe because I can't cover the whole province. I'd be here for hours. And I don't know as much about the whole province because we've done more work along the southern fringe where we have most of our conservation uh, challenges. Uh, a little bit, we're getting a little bit north of there in the, in the Elk Valley. Uh, when I started in the Flathead, bears were rarely seen in the Elk Valley around Fernie, Sparwood. They were seen up in Elkford because they had a garbage dump there. Uh, they were almost never seen in the in the trench, the dry trench land, where I can remember when the first bears started moving into the farmlands near Elko and, and people were talking about it. Now there's quite a few bears in the Elk Valley. I mean, Clayton Lamb's been working there recently and I think he's caught 45 bears or something now right in the Elk Valley between Fernie and Sparwood up to Elkford, uh, not in the mountains, remote stuff, but close to close to all the human settlement and ski resorts and all that. And we're seeing more and more in the in the Rocky Mountain Trench as well. Going, I'm going fast, so I'm going to and uh, two populations, one of the cabins, and one of the yak, they are, yeah, I think, pretty, relatively poor bear habitat. And, and they've done an incredible amount of work, and they've kept those populations stable or even increasing a bit. And they've done a great job of, of keeping them you know, doing okay. A little bit further to the South Selkirks, which is, you know, goes in the U.S. and up towards Nelson. Uh, I remember when John Almack, he was a U.S. biologist, started working in there in the very early 1980s. He had a hard time finding the bear. He trapped and caught bears, hundreds of black bears, and, and uh, finally caught one. They were they were not that abundant, and uh, people have monitored that population bears people for a long time, and then Mike for the last 20 years or so. And uh, the, the population has expanded at about 3% a year to the point where they're now spilling out into the into the uh, uh, Creston farmlands and, and Mike is doing a great job of dealing with uh, interface bears and, and the other population that we So uh, it's something just quite positive. Uh, a little bit further, the Kettle Granby, we did an inventory there in the 1990s because of course it was thought to be doing very poorly and it was. Uh, Years later, they increased by about 60% their DNA based mark recapture. So, that population, it's not, it's not, you know, it's again pretty marginal. It's not great bear habitat, but it's, uh, you know, they're, they're expanding uh, slowly. And, Bruce, and, uh, Bruce yeah. we've got on the slide the, 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 the map of BC with the population units. So, this is great because we can see where you're talking about. But, can you maybe just speak to the the, you know, there's the big red line through the middle block through the middle of the south where the extirpation area and the difference between yes. that, you know, what, what does, what does Boy, extirpation that, mean? Um, that's, that's the dry Okanagan mostly. It's, uh, you know, here's the, you know, I, it's a pretty rough line. We now have bears spilling into it quite a bit, particularly males. Uh, it, it's a pretty fuzzy line. Uh, when I left, you know, the, the government guys are now thinking of, of getting rid of that whole thing and, and because we do have some bears falling in. There's lots of areas there where, where there are not grizzly bears and I don't think we really want grizzly bears. I mean, you got the Okanagan outdoors and vineyards and, you know, Kelowna and Vernon and, you know, Soyuz and it's dry. It's not the greatest bear habitat except for all the fruit trees, of course. But uh, I can't see that being a management goal to recover grizzly bears into you know the Okanagan. I mean that that would be a <laughs> that that would be a huge challenge. But anyway, I I was going to head off across to the south south. I don't know much time to the south coast mountains where where uh, and then then I'll work back into there a bit maybe because it, starting in about 2004 we started doing work in in the southern coast mountains and uh, and you know Michelle worked mostly in the southern. Uh, Chilcotin and the Steina Hadalach. Uh, the South Chilcotin is pretty good bear habitat. Numbers are gradually increasing about 3% a year. Uh, there's areas there that have really, really good little bear populations. I mean, the, whole, the whole area is doing quite well. Uh, the Steina Hadalach is the 
are one of the bad ones. It's uh, isolated, inbred bears, very few bears, not doing well. It needs some, some TLC, that's for sure. That population, if we're gonna recover it, it's definitely gonna need some, uh, some management action and uh, it's not doing that well. Uh, the, the, I know most people, a lot of people, anyway, I don't know where everyone is, but, but are interested in the, in the, the sea to sky area. And I've been working there as well with Steve Rochetta, and he would give a much better idea of what's going on because uh, that's his study. I just catch the bears for him and help him out with the DNA and stuff whenever I can. But uh, he's got an amazing memory for where every single bear seems to be. And we, we have ID over 500 bears in the South Coast Range from, uh, from, you know, from where Michelle works south, uh, and he knows where most of them are. But generally, uh, the, the Squamish, Lillooet, like west of Highway 99 through Whistler, the population is, is generally expanding. There's some great bear habitat in the Ryan River and the Upper Meager and Manatee and into the Upper Squamish, Elaho, uh, Ashloo even. There's, there's some really good bear habitat. The bears are doing quite well. They've been increasing down through the uh, Callahan and, in, and into the Brandywine. Uh, there's you know quite a few bears that they, they move throughout all that area. I mean, but yeah. but they're you know they're doing well. When you cross into the uh, east side of the highway, uh, they're not. That's the what we call the Garibaldi pit. There are some bears in there, but not many, and they're also doing poorly. Uh, we we don't know much about them uh, other than there aren't doesn't seem to be too many. Yeah. Uh, getting down to the very south of the uh, you know the, the uh, North Cascades near Manning Park. Uh, we had one bear there that we think from his genetics moved in from actually across the, from the other side from the from the the, uh, the Columbia Mountains uh, across through the Okanagan somehow. But you know, I don't. I'm I'm not overly convinced there's really any bears, any females anyway, in that whole ecosystem. There has been not much positive sign for many years. Um, and, and Bruce, I'll just jump in because there was a lot of really good questions um, submitted when people were registering about the individual populations, numbers, um, and so on. And so we have put together a list of resources, which Jolene will speak to at the end. So if people are wondering if we're gonna get into this in more detail, we're keeping this pretty big picture, but there are gonna be some resources that will allow you to, to, to do the research on some of, more of the local area. Well, the, 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 problem, the problem with looking at local areas is bears live over big, big areas. I, I mean, female bears are, are somewhat more restricted, but they're still usually two or 300 square kilometers. Uh, males are much larger. So if you talk about the Stein, the hat latch, well, one male will live in the entire thing. So it's not like you can talk about the, uh, you know, you know, the Texas Creek or, or you know, the Hatlatch or something, because the, the bears will move in and out. All over. Same with, uh, you know, I know people might say, well, how are the bears doing in that, in the upper reaches of the Ashloo? Well, they're coming in and out all over that area. So you can't, it's very difficult to isolate one small, those are very small drainages from a grizzly bear's point of view. And, and Bruce, I'm, I'm, I'm part of my job is watching the time. So I am going to give you just a few minutes to speak to the look ahead, which we talked about, which was what is the, what, you know, looking at what's happened on the landscape in the past, what, do you, what is predicted for grizzlies in the context of climate change? That's a question that comes up a lot. Yep. Oh, absolutely. It is a question that we've had quite a few as bear biologists. Uh, you know, we've had quite a few meetings and discussions on it, particularly to do with the Rockies. I've met with the Yellowstone people and, and Albertans and Montanans and Proctor and us. We've had several meetings and, and uh, uh, it's, it's a very challenging question for many reasons and particularly over a bigger area. For one, is British Columbia is very ecologically complex. We go from, from you know, uh, rainforests on the west coast to almost deserts in the interior to rainforests to dry dip mountains. It's ecologically incredibly complex. And, and to know what's going to happen with climate in all of these areas varies. It's not like everywhere is going to warm up two degrees. So, uh, you know, and, and, and how, how that what they call these climate envelopes will actually affect the ecology is very difficult. For example, in the Flathead where I've worked, you know, the Southern Rockies where I've worked for many years, uh, the climate predictions are for about 60 years from now to be a little bit warmer and more precipitation. And it will fill sort of what they call the climate envelope of South Selkirk's now, like the, or the Selkirk Mountains. There'll be more of a, a cedar hemlock sort of uh, ecosystem. 
Well, it's, it's not going to become a cedar hemlock ecosystem in 80 years because there's no cedar trees there and there's no hemlock trees and there's no, you know, there's no dozens of other species. It's going to take a long, long time to shift. So there's, there's complexity that, that, uh, that, that it's very difficult to answer. But some things that, that in general will be good and some things will be bad. And the good one fire. I mean, there's most, you know, we, I mean, I'm not a climate guy, I don't know about it, but I listen to them. And they, they say that, you know, there should be more wildfires. And wildfire is good for grizzly bears. Grizzly bears love fruit and, you know, huckleberries and buffalo berries and, you know, Saskatoon berries. They all do well in open areas. You know, you, I grow grapes. You grow them in the open, you know, grow them in the forest. Uh, so uh, fruit will probably increase. Other things will not do well. White bark pine will not do well. It's not doing well now. There's blisters. Both of those seem to be affected a bit by warmer climates. Uh, the one that's obviously uh, probably going to do poorly is salmon. I mean, I'm no salmon guy, but I have a lot of commercial Alaskan commercial salmon fishermen friends, and they, they're not over optimistic about the future of salmon. So perhaps the coast will have a, a great decline in salmon. On the other hand, it might have a lot of fires, so it might turn into a, a more of a berry ecosystem for bears than, than the salmon one it is now. But one thing that people don't appreciate as much as I think is going to happen, and largely it's because I work with Americans, when I bring it up, they don't like it, and it's, it's uh, climate refugees. I mean, I mean, I'm just guessing because I'm not a climate guy, but what's going to happen to Texans and people from Oklahoma and whatnot when it gets warmer and they can't afford air conditioning and stuff. I mean, what's going to happen if we have a whole bunch of people moving up here? And, you know, some of, them, some of them have more guns than we do and all the rest of the things. I mean, that that could be a, uh, uh, I think, a, 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 ma a major issue in the in the future if we do actually have climate refugees and more and more people right. to live in British right. Columbia than, than Texas and Florida and I don't know whatever yeah. else is work. And we'll and I guess we'll, we're, we've got a we've got a section on the kind of intersection between people and bears and that we'll get into in a bit. So maybe um Lana can I thanks Bruce. <laughs> Lana can I turn this next one over to you? Um we're you know putting us into a little bit of context now and obviously we've you know, we're into spring and the bears have been emerging from their dens and um, really um, one of the questions that seemed to come up a lot was around, um, you know, are, whether bears are, you know, what bears are doing when they're in their dens. Um, is it a true hibernation? Um, so maybe I can get you to speak to that for a few minutes. Oh, let's just unmute you here. There we go. Okay, yay, um, hibernation, yes, it's great. So bears hibernate to conserve energy. Hibernation is a function of food availability. So let's, uh, let's talk bears. We have eight bear species that live on four continents. Not all of those bear species are gonna hibernate. Did you know that? There's a little fact for you. So if we go to South America, you have the Andean bear, the spectacle bear there. It's not gonna hibernate, and why is that? Because it lives in a tropical environment and the foods are available. Okay, so we can even go over to our Southeast Asia and we can look at the sun bear and the sloth bear over there and they have, they go up in trees and these tree nests, but they don't actually hibernate because it's a function of food availability. What happens here in British Columbia is we get these cold winters in the snow and there's no food available for the bears. There's limited food available and it makes more sense for them to conserve their energy by going into a den site and hibernating. When they hibernate, they don't eat, urinate, or defecate. So that is an amazing physiological process. If, if we were to do that, we would develop osteoporosis, our bones would get weak, um, they would break, okay? So bears are studied a lot for that because um, it's a real phenomenon. They actually deposit a layer of calcium on their bones eats hibernation. And as researchers, we can take advantage of that because when we capture them, we can pull a little tooth behind their canine and called a premolar, it's just very small, send it to a lab. They can slice that open and like a tree ring, they can read the, the each year where it hibernates and it deposits that calcium and give us an age on those animals. Very, very useful for us, okay? So it's an amazing physiology that the bears have. 
Also, when they den, females are going to make a decision. Bears are, have delayed implantation and induced ovulation. Okay, so the egg and sperm are going to meet, it's going to free float around, so it's not actually going to implant on the uterine wall like we do, and nine months later we have a baby. They're going to go in their den site, and they're going to den for a while, and then they're going to ask themselves, hmm, do I have enough fat to sustain myself? The answer is yes. One little cub's going to implant, do I have enough for two? Yes. Two's going to, so where food becomes so important, right, because the fatter the bears are, the more those females are going to have, right? But that whole process happens in hibernation while they're not eating urinating or defecating, that whole growth, the gestation now happens. And then you have these little teeny cubs. So I pulled lots of black bear cubs out. I've never done it with grizzly bear cubs. I, I don't recommend it for anybody, but this is done for, for research. Um, but they, when they're born, they're tiny, little hairless, kind of like rats, <laughs> I hate to say it, <laughs> but uh, they grow very quickly on that, on that milk. It's so rich and it's so um, full of, of nutrition for them, right? So she's got to put that out while she's doing it. So the fatter she can go in that den, the, the better. Now, um, you asked about hibernation versus, um, you know, are they true hibernators, right? Okay. We say bears are not true hibernators. Why? Let's say we go dig up a ground squirrel. We're going to take a look at that ground squirrel and we're going to think, oh my God, it's dead, right? It, it's beats per minute of its heart are like three in, in a whole minute, right? Its metabolism is at next to zero. It's not burning any fat. It's doing like this. Bears aren't like that. They barely drop their heart rate, right? They, they barely drop their temperature. And, and why? Because they're going through these processes of gestation, and these different things. And also their dens, we can talk about den structure if we have time. They usually just have the one opening for security reasons, okay? But they need to be able to rouse quickly. That brown squirrel's not rousing quickly, right? So that, the, but that bear may be able to rouse quickly. So those processes, although they're, they decline, they're not to that point of where it's really, really, really low, right? So then we say our bear is true hibernators, but when we look at what our, our physiologists tell us, yes, they are. And why? Because they do drop their metabolic rate, okay? So that's, that's really important, and that's what they decided. And so, yes, bears are hibernators, but they are not true hibernators. I don't know, Claire, how much time do I have left? Because no, I can talk about bears and hibernation that, forever. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> um, and then we had some questions that we kind of linked with this, being uh, thinking about what females are doing in hibernation. And so um, we had a question around um, whether a female can carry offspring from different males at the same time. We thought this was an interesting question. And we're going to throw this to uh, Michael. Please. I can unmute you here. There you go. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming tonight. Um, just sort of a little easier answer. Uh, yes, they can carry offspring from different males. Uh, males uh, have large home ranges, and they usually overlap several female home ranges, and they, you know, try to mate with as many females as they can. And uh, females, of course, have a bunch of varying suitors after them, so they uh, they mate with multiple females, a little bit, or excuse me, multiple males. Uh, I describe it in a, a lot of times as like the universities uh, in the 1960s when uh, everybody was sort of mating with everybody else. And um, interestingly, there's uh, not everybody scores as, even though they mate. So the, uh, there's a, a skewed uh, fitness success or the, the, so some males have many of the population's offspring and some males have very few to none. And at least in my studies, I've actually looked at the reproductive success of females, and it's a little bit the same. Some of the females are dominating with the six surviving offspring. They all have a, the same amount of offspring, but so they have a, both sexes have a skewed success ratio. But uh, and a lot of you people probably not old enough to remember the university in the '60s, but uh, Bruce and I are. At, at any rate, uh, that, that's my answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. And then the next one, we thought we'd throw this out to um, the audience. So we're going to throw a poll to you to see um, whether you think that grizzly bears and black bears um, went, can mate and produce offspring. So you should see a poll in front of you. Let's get your votes and then we'll, we'll check in and we'll, we'll throw this to Michelle to tell us if we get it right or wrong. So give you 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to close it now. 
Okay, so Michelle, we had 25% saying yes, 59% saying no, and then, and then a solid 15%, 16% maybes. Well, I would probably say that you're all kind of right. Um, apparently, in some zoos in London about 100 years ago, they successfully got black bears and European brown bears, which are grizzly bears, but in Europe, to reproduce. And the offspring they produced survived and later reproduced back with brown bears again. So it is possible. Some people have said that they've, this has maybe happened in the wild, but over the thousands of thousands of bears now that we've captured using DNA mark recapture all over North America, it doesn't seem to happen that often, if ever, in the wild. So, no. Unlike, but grizzly bears have also reproduced with other species in zoos. So they, when they often do with polar bears, or maybe not often, but it's much more common and much more recent in uh, with polar bears. Okay. And then another question that came up a lot um, that we thought we'd have some fun with uh, another audience poll is um, how long do grizzly bears live on average in the wild? So for the audience, how long do you think grizzly bears um, live for in the wild? So the poll should be in front of you there. Michelle, we're going to get you to do this one as well, please. You want me to do it? Well, do the, do the answer. <laughs> Tell us the answer. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'm not allowed, it says. <laughs> you guys know the answers. We can't let you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to close this one now, and I will share the results. And so we've got 32% um, thinking 10 to 20 years, uh, over half of the people on the call saying 20 to 30 years, and then... Um, 13% for 30 to 40 years, and then 2% 40 plus. So bears in average age of bears in the wild. Um, wow, well you kind of got me because the question that I got was how long do bears live in the wild? Oh, the, there you go. How long do they live on average in the wild? So it's kind of different in a way because if bears make it to their first or second year, through the first or second year, which many of them don't so many the survival rate of cubs is anywhere from 30 percent to about 85 percent depending on the population and if they survive that those first few years uh, the oldest bears that were grizzly bears are were I think 37 in the Yukon and uh, there was one in the flathead you're saying at first which, which was shot at 32 years old and then and there's been thousands and thousands in the in the you know DNA or in the database of where bears that have been hunted or killed for other reasons and I think the oldest one in there was 36 years old so but anywhere from 25 to 30 to 40 is probably the max age okay so our, our audience is pretty tuned in on that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did well. Okay, so um, thank you guys. We're going to jump into the next kind of, uh, section that questions kind of naturally fell into were around grizzly bear behavior. Um, you know, we, we all know that grizzly bears are these highly intelligent um, and because they're quite an iconic species, quite often their, uh, you know, their antics make it into the, our, our, our hearts and, and sometimes the headlines. Um, so there's lots of people who are fascinated by the behaviors um, and especially those of us who get to live in bear country. So um, let's fly through some of these. So first one, I'm going to fire over to Lana. Um, Lana, can you tell us why bears rub on trees? And for people, if they're watching this, this video is going to play in the background, but you're not missing anything if you're not seeing any sound. There's no, or if you're not hearing any sound because we haven't got the sound on it. We're going to listen to Lana instead. Okay, yay, why do bears like to scratch themselves on trees? I'm not a bear, nor do I know anybody else, so guess what? We are going to guess, and it is most often believed to be a method of communication between bears. Why do we think that? 
When they scratch themselves on trees, they usually do other behaviors as well. You'll see some of these males might be doing it in my videos, but usually they urinate and the urine runs down their legs. And marked trees are often associated with marked trails. We know that bears have scent glands in their feet. And when they come up to trees, sometimes they'll mark a nice trail. We call it, sometimes call it cowboying. Well, they'll step in the same place year after year, generation after generation, and they'll twist those feet, getting those scent pads to activate, and the males will urinate down their legs at the same time, getting that in there. When they go to these trees, what we think is when they leave all these scents, okay, it's a method of communication. Other bears can come up and make decisions. Sometimes, and a lot of times, bears don't even actually mark the tree. They'll sit there at the base of it, and they'll just smell up and down, absorbing that sensory information. You can kind of you almost hear them thinking as they're doing it. So it may help them, the grizzly bears, they may have, a large male may have been there and a, a mom comes along with cubs of the year, cubs and she smells what's going on and she says, you know what, I'm not going that way. And she just turns around and goes the other way. So she's avoiding confrontations or a younger male may avoid a confrontation with a larger male. Okay, so it may help males, uh, of bears avoid each other, may help them actually find mates. Okay, do we see this behavior being really density dependent? That's some really good uh, research that was published by Clayton Lamb recently about the density dependentness of mark marking um, structures, trees, and marked trails. Okay, so it may help bears in breeding season connect with each other, find each other, and find mates, okay? And in the end, you know, I'm sure it really just feels good because sometimes they just look like they're having a really good time getting rid of that winter coat. Marty, you see marking behavior um, also more in certain seasons, the breeding season and the spring, okay? And they leave big clumps of hair on the trees. Um, so sometimes it looks like it just feels really good. So I think that, there we go. Why grizzly bears mark trees? Anybody <laughs> else want to contribute to that on the panel? No, I think no. I'm not seeing <laughs> I'm not seeing hands. So I think you nailed it, Lana. Um, another one that came up, um, you know, thinking about finding maybe bear hair in unusual areas and bears in the headlines. Um, one of the questions that came up a couple of times was around why bears are heading over to Vancouver Island and swimming over to the island. Did you have any thoughts on that, Lana? No, I have thoughts on everything to do with bears. But yeah, okay. So let's look at uh, that one. Why are bears swimming over to the island? What amazes me every time I see this is, is like, really? I mean, bears have probably always swum over to Vancouver Island. Okay? A lot of these are our young sub-adult males. So what happens is to avoid this real inbreeding, the mother allows part, her female offspring to have part of her home range. So home ranges for females can kind of look like matriarchs stringing out. Males, uh-uh, no way. You get to an age, they get kicked out you're out and they'll hang around that area for a while but then they'll be made to, to disperse find their own area find their own territory and as bruce mentioned earlier males can have extremely large home ranges we've had home ranges up to 5,000 kilometers square okay so they're trying to have the maximum amount of females in their home range so they can breed maximally not every female is going to re be re receptive to breeding each year she's not breeding when she has cubs on her and grizzlies um, have their cubs for quite a long time right? So he wants to maximize that area. So of course they're swimming over to Vancouver Island. They're checking it out. What's here? What's in the territory, right? Now you got to understand something. Vancouver Island's becoming a lot more developed and habitats being taken up. I think people are seeing the bears more than they were before. Just because seven people report seven bit, you know, call in does not mean there's seven different bears. It could be one bear that seven people are seeing, right? So I don't think that this is anything new. I don't think this is anything you know, what's kind of more interesting question is how come before us, we don't think there was ever a resident population on Vancouver Island. So what that means is we don't consider grizzly bears on Vancouver Island because we don't have a breeding population here. We don't have females having cubs here, right? So, but that doesn't mean that they don't come here and, and check it out and leave and hang out for a bit and eat. It took a lot to swim here. What are you going to do? Go use all your energy and swim back and have something to eat. So, you know, I, I don't I don't find that question um I, I don't find sorry grizzly bears on Vancouver Island to be shocking at all. Okay. Anyone else? I'm watching for hands. No, okay. I, I, I could say that the, the, the research done on the ABC Isles, Admiral Chichikov and Baranoff 
found that, that males will quite commonly cross up to seven kilometers of water. That happens a lot. Females, they never get, all based on genetics, will never cross two kilometers of water. So we've probably had males going to Vancouver Island forever, but the females, it's, it's more than 2K, they probably don't make it. And that's why the mitochondrial DNA getting to something that's probably too calm, you know, uh, of the ABC islands is uh, still got, it's a polar bear lineage, not a brown bear lineage, because females have not brought the mitochondrial DNA across from the mainland, but they brought, the males have brought the nuclear DNA across, so we have brown bears but with, with uh, mitochondrial DNA from polar bears, which I find real interesting. And, and Bruce, stay leaned in here because this next question is for you. <laughs> so um, the, uh, we, we had a question around why are black bears, uh, why, sorry, why are grizzly bears portrayed as more aggressive than black bears? Uh, well. And are I, they really, the, are they really? Well, depends whose viewpoint. From a human viewpoint, when an encounter, uh, yes, they, they definitely are more aggressive if, if they're, if they perceive some, someone or, or some other animal as a threat. Uh, but in general, bears would love to go through life without perceiving anything as a threat. They try to avoid, they try to avoid confrontations as much as they can. But if, you know, they'd, they'd rather not, they'd rather love to be able to kill a moose and have no, no other animal show up to take it away from them. They'd never, they'd love to never have an encounter with a pack of wolves or a cougar or another, a nasty bear that wants to hurt a female's cubs or something. So, uh, but when those things do happen, brown bears have a very different response, grizzly bears, you know, uh, uh, and, and the theory behind it is that black bears have evolved and are still very closely associated with trees, with forests, and their escape terrain is trees. Cubs, you got the picture there, little cubs go up a tree right away, even adults go up trees quite often to avoid d danger, particularly, you know, danger of, uh, of say, a pack of wolves. Whereas grizzly bears evolve mostly in treeless areas, and, uh, and their defense is, is, is uh, an, an aggressive show, and sometimes some contact, but usually it's a show, often to communicate to whatever animal they're they're uh, feel threatened by that if you want to if you want you're going to get hurt best to leave me alone kind of thing and uh so when a when when a human gets into some kind of a uh, encounter with a, a bear and the bear perceives it as a threat uh the grizzly bears will put on quite a show and uh, uh and sometimes they will you know, ac actually make contact, but but quite often they won't, and and uh, it's it's a, an incredible performance of threat, and you'll never forget it. Uh, whereas a black bear, even if they do, it's not they haven't got the act down nearly as well. Um, but I'd like to also say that what bears perceive as a th uh, as a threat seems to change among individuals enormously, and even among areas. I kind of believe that bears that develop social graces like ones that fish in, on salmon streams in concentrations uh, are often shoulder to shoulder. I mean, I've seen 58 grizzly bears in the size of a football field and they're shoulder to shoulder and, and they spend, you know, a few months that way. They tolerate peop, uh, other bears at, at, at distances and they'll tolerate people like that. Whereas interior bears do not. They almost are never that close to the bears. If they are, as Lana says, it's usually uh, a relative, a, a daughter that they, you know, might be 15 years old, but still a daughter with her cubs, and they'll they might get closer, but uh, they just don't have the the social graces, so they they can get uh, uh, excited at, at it seems to be a bit further away. And then of course I'm also a believer that that some of the real uh, frightening encounters people have and fatal encounters may be precipitated because the bear has had a, is wound up by something else. It may have just dealt with a pack of wolves or an adult male or something, and they're revved right up, and the poor person hiking along is a bad bear who's had a bad day. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, brown, grizzly bears are, you know, in, in an encounter like that can seem way more aggressive. They have a pretty good show. You hope you never see it. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great segue into our into our next section here. So we're going to jump into, you know, how do we how do we avoid um, instances of, 
of uh, human bear conflict. And um, we thought we'd do our, our last audience poll here and we're going to ask people what they um, do when they are out in the out in bear country to try to avoid a conflict. So you should just see a poll pop up in front of you here. And so we've got the options of um, adventuring in groups, making noise, carrying bear spray, keeping your dogs on a leash, um, and avoiding areas with bear signs and activity. So we'll just give us a few more seconds here. Okay, we're ending it there. And we'll share these results. So we got a good spread here across all of these because of course this is a bit of a cheat question because the answer is you should be doing all of the above. <laughs> um, but one thing that uh, comes up a lot and gets a lot of questions um, is around the precautions and the actions to stay safe in bear country, um, whether that's just because that's somewhere that you live or whether you're out there recreating. Um, or working in bear country. And the, the safest approach is always to, to take steps to avoid encounters, um, never surprising a bear and, and, and taking, you know, taking on these actions with keeping dogs on a leash, et cetera. But um, a really common question, and, and Michael, I'm gonna put this your way is, um, you know, we talk a lot about bear spray and the importance of carrying bear spray and knowing how to use it. And, and but, um, you know, from the research, how, uh, effective is, is bear spray in real terms? Um, very effective. There's quite a bit of evidence that suggests if you carry bear spray, uh, you uh, humans and bears uh, do much better. Um, the, um, probably the biggest concern about bear spray is having bear spray really handy. It's not only do, is bear spray effective and everything, but it's actually somewhere where you can use it in a quick time scale so if you if you run into a surprise bear and she or he attacks you really have to be ready so if it's in your pack it's not really very good and if it's you know even somewhere else uh, so have it really uh, nice nice and ready um uh that's uh it's it's effective I, I think there's a lot of stories we hear a lot of the encounters from the co's and all that where um uh, the, uh people are really saved from uh, attacks but uh, Sometimes I recommend if you're really nervous, you carry two bear sprays. I had heard several stories where a bear has rushed in and attacked a person and he's repelled it with a bear spray and then it runs away 50 meters and it turns around and comes back. So you don't want to shoot it all in your first dose or keep a little for a spare, a spare dose. Uh, I think that's an important thing to uh, remember. Yeah, and in the, uh, in the resources, when we send information out after this webinar, we are going to send you all and everybody who registered resources and there is a, a a really great video on on using bear spray that jolene's included in those as well so um. yeah and, and i think the important thing to remember people often think that they're safer with a gun because it kills the bear and in maybe some circumstances you are but most bear attacks or encounters like bruce was explaining a show of aggression are really sort of bluff to get you to leave and if you have a gun you may be shooting at the bear way too early when it really it wasn't ever necessary and then you maybe possibly wound that bear and then you get hurt because you wound a bear and it's uh, pretty mad. And so the whole thing spirals out of control. So the mechanism of bear spray is it, it forces you to not do anything until the bear is much closer and often it's a fake charge and, and you end up safe and the bear ends up safe. So it's a nice thing. One thing I wanted to add about your poll there, probably the one of the things I, I don't see people do a lot, and we teach a lot in our bear safety courses, is to really learn bear habitat and bear signs so you're actually smarter in the woods. The, the sidebar to that is a lot more fun when you're out there to know what kind of habitats you're in. If you're really in great bear habitat, then you know, okay, we better pay attention here. We, we're in a huckleberry patch, which is obvious, but some other places, riparian areas and avalanche shoots. So if you learn a little bit more about the ecology of bears, you'll have more fun out there, but then you'll be a little smarter and uh, you can avoid those signs. So. Yeah, and, and um, Lana, you did a, a fair bit of work looking here in the area that I'm in, in, in Whistler around uh, the recreation, um, uh, some of the specific recreation impacts of bears and what Michael was just talking around, 
you know, knowing the habitats and being able to recognize the risk factors around um, where, where you're recreating. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about how um, recreation activities impact grizzly bears? Sure. So um, how do recreational activities impact grizzly bears? First off, let's say that not all recreation is equal and not all recreation is going to be equal in its impact on bears. Okay, if someone's out hiking and has their dog on a leash and is taking precautions, there's no reason why grizzly bears and humans can't coexist and get along when we are knowledgeable, as uh, Michael was talking about, in bear country and we respect the fact that we have now entered the bear's home. Okay, so not all recreation is, is, is taken equally. But let's talk about some different things. So, you know, mountain biking is what you're talking about there that I worked on in Whistler. And so one of the things with mountain biking is, and the, 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 the study they did, a mountain biker going uphill has no greater chance of having a negative encounter with a grizzly bear than a hiker. Okay, and why is this? Because it slows them much down and they're going much more slower and they're looking ahead and they're doing these things. Now, when you're on the top of that hill and you're coming down in a mountain bike biking situation, you need to concentrate on that track because you're zooming in and out, you're going fast, you are not making that noise, you're not looking around at what's going on around you in the bigger picture. That's what bears need. They need you to be paying attention, making noise. They'll, you know, majority of the time, they'll move out of your way and avoid conflicts with you if you give them the opportunity to do that, okay? So when we talk about these things, those things. Now that we can talk about motorized access, okay, now you're getting even to another level of impact on bears. Then let's talk about what's really going on, heli access, okay? Michelle told me the other day about heli yoga and heli golf. I had no idea. People do heli yoga and heli golf. I mean, you gotta be kidding. I'm not taking a machine up the side of a mountain. I'm watching it going right up the side of the mountain. Mountain goats are jumping off. Everything's going crazy, right? So when we talk about the recreational impacts on these ones, you've got three main issues. You have excess energy output. So that animal is going to take off. And okay, now it's excess energy output. It's losing things. It can't just go to a superstore. It's finally put that fat on and now it's, it's being chased and, and harassed, right? It can be displaced. So if it's too much, it can actually be like, I'm all going to be here, man. There's just way too many people. It's in prime habitat. You know, I'm, I'm going to move, Maybe go to a lower quality habitat, right? To avoid people. So now it's not where it could be, right? And the third one is increased mortality risk. Okay, so you have an increased risk of mortality. When there's a negative encounter, it's not usually the bear who's given the benefit of the doubt. Okay, sometimes it is, and that's great, but, some, but a lot of times it's not. So we can have increased mortality risk. So these are resulting from these recreational impacts on, on bears. But like Mike said, there's ways we can, um, and like your poll indicates, there's ways we can reduce this. P proper trail planning. Okay, so get your habitat suitability maps. Use all the data you got on grizzly bears. You know, find that high quality habitat and avoid it avoid it with the trails in the first place, right? Some of those trails are already in existence and that's really difficult to do. So um, th those kind of things. So you might want to move trails if you're having a lot of conflict, close them, give the bear the benefit of the doubt if, if something's in there, um, have seasonal closures. So if it's really good habitat in huckleberry season and your trail goes through there, then guess what? Humans aren't, right? So give, give the bear that that thing. So there's things that we can do to avoid that stress, avoid that ex energy expenditure that's going on, and avoid that potential for displacement and avoid mortality of grizzly bears overall. Um, I don't know. You want me to answer more? <laughs> Does anybody have anything else they want to add on that? Or Michelle? The other recreational piece is our, our hunters and their impact is different because they're one of the only recreator, rec, recreators that travel with rifles and um, when they have negative encounter they often it often results in the bear being shot so in that case it's also difficult for them to make noise because they're trying to find an animal so um, maybe the, if hunters also carry bear spray as well as just a rifle that might uh, reduce the potential for conflicts and also if once they when they're not hunting or once they've got an animal to make a lot more noise at that point <laughs> to, get, to not run into them after the fact mm -hmm. and one of the other things that um gets talked about with uh the with the hunting side of things is the, the storage of 
kill animals that they've killed but um you know there is the conversation around bears that are you know anything that is out there and smells good acts as a bear attractant and 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 you know bears follow the nose so with they the dead meat in their in their camp site it they have to protect it as they would garbage or anything else like so you have to hang your meat really high electric fences and make sure that you're preventing any bear from coming in there from preventing bears from getting access to that meat and also not leaving a gut pile keeping a clean camp being responsible for what you've what you've got mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe on that food link lana can we go into your the question for you around the difference between a food conditioned bear and a habituated bear yeah so first i, I really want to thank you for this question i so happy you asked it. It is a huge pet peeve of mine. It, okay, so food conditioning and habituation to humans are two completely separate behaviors. Okay, so their roots are actually ground in psychology. Food conditioning is operant conditioning. It's what um, you learned about when you had Pavlov's dog. You can teach the dog to worry about and it salivates and gets a, a reward, right? Okay, so it's a reward-based system. So what the bear is doing is it's doing a behavior or an action, right? Say it's getting your garbage that you left out, it's getting to that can, and the reward is all the food of that, that garbage, okay? So now it's been rewarded. And that behavior is, hmm, and bears are very smart. Don't forget, like, if you imagine if we just spent, uh, you know, three or four years with our mom and then we were kicked out in the wild and, and had to survive, they learn extremely quickly. It takes very few instances for that learning to happen in that animal and for it to then become sort of a more habitual behavior. Okay, let's talk about habituation to humans now. Okay, habituation to humans has no, it's habituation to, should work on no reward, no punishment. So basically it's a neutral stimulus, okay, a neutral stimuli. So the bear comes in there and it, so let's take bear viewing, an excellent example. Okay? So there's, there should be absolutely no rewards anywhere in any properly run bear viewing operation. There are not any rewards anywhere. So the people are just there viewing the, and the animals. So the bear sees the people, well, it's not getting a reward from them. It's not making an association between the humans and the food. It hasn't done any, any of that, right? But it's not getting negative punishment either. So it stops running away, right? It stops fleeing. It, it, it doesn't respond to that neutral stimuli anymore. We couldn't have bear viewing being done um, by the operations that are good on our coast um, if bears were also food conditioned, if these two behaviors weren't different and bears didn't look at them differently. Okay? Now what's interesting about habituation too is that bears can have habituation, it can be area specific, so they can kind of know that oh in this area, you know it's an area where I go into and I get all the salmon and all these you know, stupid people watch me, right? <laughs> you know, stupid people, but it's, you know, that's what the baby little bear is going, all these people are watching me, right? And um, no reward or question, but somewhere else where it's not, I'm not expecting to encounter a person, I could encounter a person and then be like, whoa, right? Really expect that there and have that behavior and flee. The bear's food conditioned and habituated to humans, if those two behaviors come together, that can be that can lead to real problems because now the bear is not afraid of people and it associates people with rewards okay so that those can be our bears that usually we end up having to remove because that behavior is just escalated to a point where it, it's very very difficult to deter it now and with those beautiful segue line into the next question but with those um you know we quite often hear about this idea of why don't we just relocate problem bears um, and and um, you know it's, it's it is a question that's asked a lot um, and and is tied so closely to the human bear conflict so did you want to go into that a little bit absolutely okay so let's talk about that so we can just pick up a bear and relocate it we can we relocate lots of bears right but what are we doing we're relocating a, a problem it, it, this is reactive management right so we can be proactive we need to be proactive we need to stop what's causing that problem before it occurs and before a bear becomes to a point where we want need to where relocation is something that's suggested as a management technique okay what are you doing when you relocate a bear you're taking it you're putting it into another area well there's not a lot of just pristine habitat you're going to 
plunk that bear into it, you know, there's probably already another bear there. So what's the impact on that other bear? What are the impact on those people that you've just moved that animal into? You know, do they have a track? Is it just going to cause a problem in, an, in another area? So you're just moving that problem, right? It's like a catch-22. And if you don't clean up what's going on, another bear is just going to come into the original area and your problem starts all over again. So relocation is not a solution. Relocation is reacting to a problem that's occurring. You can, we, we can prevent that problem. We can easily prevent it. Keep your garbage um, secure at all times in bear season, right? Um, pick your fruit before it's falling from those trees. You know, consider using electric fencing um, or use electric fencing for your bear traps like chicken coops or those kind of things. So there's so many solutions we can implement if we do it properly. We're creating the problem bears. Problem bears are not born. They're made out of human ignorance. Okay? So we need to stop that problem in the first place rather than reacting to the problem. It might make you feel good to move that bear, but it's not the solution. Uh, I think Mike Proctor might have more to add on that too. Yeah, I would add just a little bit. She, she's right. If you don't, you, you just can't move your problem away and expect things to go away. But we do use relocation a lot as a sort of a temporary management tool. We've we've been I've been working with the COs for many years, uh, trying to solve the. We're trying to teach the people not to attract bears. We're trying to teach the COs how not to kill bears. And we're trying to teach the bears how to avoid um, the people in the first place. So um, we really, what we do is go in and really try to clean up those attractants and clean up the attractant in the neighborhood. If a bear gets uh, brought into one house and you clean up the attractants, but the neighbor has got a lot, it doesn't do them any good. So it's kind of complicated. But we often move a bear, we relocate it, but this is an important point within the home range of the bear. So that's not really something terribly unfamiliar. You're not putting them into another ecosystem. You're not competing with a bunch of, you're just teaching that bear to, um, you know, stay away from the humans after we've done some fun things to it to discourage it from coming back. But in general, we've had, a, if we uh, selected bears that are what I call conflict light bears, we've had pretty good success with either relocating them, a, you know, a kilometer or up to 10 kilometers within their home range, uh, we've had some pretty good success rate, up, upwards of 50% keeping bears alive. And some bears are too far down what Lana called the food condition thing, and they're gonna end up having to be removed and killed. But uh, relocation is used in a, a, within a home range as a temporary tool, and it's pretty effective. So it's nice to sort of separate these out. Uh, it's just not, you know, the word relocation covers a lot of different options, but the long distance relocation we'll talk about in a later question is, uh, um, slightly useful, but not very useful. Last resort. Thanks, Michael. Anybody else got anything to add on this one? No? Okay. Um, so, uh, Michael, we're going to stick with you for the next one around a um, uh, uh, popular question in BC because we've got these big highways and there's been some successes um, touted from other mountain communities around um, wildlife overpasses. So. Um, the question that was coming up from audience members was why can't more highway over or underpasses be built for wildlife? Yeah, and it's partially a good question, but partially misses the real, uh, real point of the issue. And, and, and these highway overpasses are typically built to reverse fragmentation so we can get connectivity to across a, a, a valley. But really what our research has shown over many, many years is that that fragmentation is mainly caused by people living along those highways and then luring them in with their attractants um, that we've just talked about with conflict. So um, we, we can build more overpasses. They're very expensive and they're usually only done when you're rebuilding a highway anyway. So you have to wait 20 or 20 years for them to come along. But they're important, like the, the ones in the picture there are in Banff National Park where they have very high vehicle per day rates of up to 15,000 vehicles per day. And that can, bears still actually cross those highways at, the, at those levels, but um, they, they are useful and it, it took a long time for bears to use them, but they eventually are using them. But uh, like I say, the real problem is fixing uh, uh, or retraining the humans along those settled corridors to not attract bears and to get killed. That's re really the bigger issue. So, um, uh, we can't just rely on 
overpasses to solve our fragmentation problems. We need to sort of retrain the human population. The good news is it's not that hard to contain your uh, tract. Is we're looking at a problem that's plagued North American bears for a, a 70 to 100 years. It's just not that big of a deal to clean up your garbage and secure it. Uh, I did it in my yard in about two days and uh, I a little bit of electric fencing and some places it's more complex than others but what we're asking of the people to do to get along with wildlife is is not that complicated if you put your mind to it and uh, so we had I'm we had um a, a grizzly bear sighting actually in the community of whistler here this uh spring which is unusual um in in on on one of the neighborhood streets um and it was really interesting having you know talk to people about how their barbecues for bears can basically be big popsicles that they want to go along and check out. Um, people suddenly put the barbecues away a bit faster when we were talking grizzlies <laughs> than blacks. But you know, that, that kind of, once you take care of the attractants for it, it benefits both, uh, both species. So, um, uh, yeah, that's a very good, very good point that the things we do for grizzly bear conservation, really helpful for black bears. Black bears are really not a conservation issue in British Columbia because they're plentiful and they have a quicker reproductive rate and they can sustain more mortality. But on the other hand, it's nice to get along with the wildlife we share in British Columbia. And you know, we can all, we can all learn from that. So also black bears are good training for grizzly bears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, obviously what you guys work on um, day to day and uh, is, uh, you know, and that has taught us so much ab about the things that we've been talking about today is comes from studies. So um, there were some really uh, good questions around grizzly bears studies and how we know what we know. So um, we're going to kick off with a question for Bruce here. Um, in that why does a lot of the grizzly bear research focus so heavily on um, females and cubs and again i'm just going to start for the audience i'm going to start a video here just for background we're going to listen to um bruce but those um so there's no sound so don't panic if you're not hearing bear noises should i talk yeah have at her well, bruce uh just one quick comment on on overpasses and that i i believe they only really work once you fence the highway and uh and the, the fencing is usually done to stop vehicle accidents with wildlife that cost ICBC, which is the insurance company of British Columbia, uh, you know, millions of dollars a year and costs human lives when they hit moose and things. So uh, uh, once you fence the highway, the, uh, you know, you're saving a lot of money on, on those costs. And then you have to put overpasses in or you fragmented the area. I don't, I don't think animals will cross an overpass if the highway is wide open. They'll just walk across the highway. Still, I was involved with that on the on the Coca Coca-Cola connector about in 1980 something with moose and deer in the winter when I was a grad student. Anyway, um, females uh, obviously <laughs> females have babies, males don't. So that's the the uh, the main reason we concentrate on females. Uh, if you can maintain if you keep females alive, uh, they'll have they'll have their litters and raise their litters and, and the population will do fine. Um, I mean males more or less just provide sperm. That's, that's all males are good for. They don't do anything else and uh, for yeah they might do other things that maybe aren't good for the population <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, why do we study females? Uh, another one is that females usually have a litter every three or four years so they only breed every three or four years so it's not like we need a pile of males around really to, to inseminate the females uh, as long as we keep the female survival rates above about 92 percent in most pop most areas the population will be viable i mean that's that's about the tipping point for you know it varies with habitat quality and of course cub survival and as, as michelle had pointed out cub survival is highly variable it's uh, generally quite low in, uh, in populations near Cairn capacity, like uh, the, the very far northern unhunted populations like uh, Denali, it's, uh, you know, cub mortality is very high. Uh, Katmai, cub mortality is very high. Kluwani, cub mortality is really high. Uh, northern Yukon, they're all, they're all less than half the cubs will make it. Whereas you get down further 
south where human cause mortality is higher, populations are a little below carrying capacity. Uh, males have a much higher mortality rate down south than females do, and cub survival is quite a bit higher. Um, anyway, we, we, st we like keeping females around because they're the ones that have the babies, and you got babies, you'll have bears. Any farmer will know that when he with his cow. <laughs> you need cows <laughs> more than bulls. And one of the things that um, and 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 Michael, I'm 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 going to put this one to you. But one of the things that comes up when you know looking at threatened population units and figuring out how to try to recover population units, um, one of the uh, things that comes up quite frequently is um, you know we talked earlier about why. The relocation of bears is, is challenging but are there some instances where grizzlies in particular that you would um, translate translocate grizzlies out of their home range um, for example to recover a threatened population unit um, yeah it's um, it's been a pretty effective it's a it's a challenging but sometimes effective technique but probably the best example in north america is just south of where i live here in the u.s they've had a very small basically almost eradicated or eliminated um, population in the Cabinet Mountains. Uh, and in the 90s, they went in to Bruce's study area and took four bears and put them in the Cabinet Mountains. They were translocating, and these were four young females that were pre or close to their maturity age. So they're not cubs or two-year-olds, but I think three to five-year-olds, and they moved them into the cabinets. And then they, uh, one of them, they found out over like decades later when we got genetic uh, testing involved, one of those females ended up basically saving the cabinet population. Uh, three of them never came to, uh, they, uh, one of them died right away and a couple of them survived, but they didn't reproduce. So you have to first survive and then reproduce to be useful. But this one female right now in the cabinets, there's maybe 20 bears, 24 bears in this population and like 22 of them came from this female. And there was two natural males or, you know, resident males in that population and she bred with both of them and the, whole, the rest of the population is built on them. So they've continued that program uh, to this day, they're still doing it. And they have a very slow, uh, just a few bears a year um, where they actually translocate them into the population. And it's mostly, like I said, young, uh, premature uh, females, but even now they're moving a few males in there just for the genetic variability. They've had very few males and they're all related to those two original residents. So they're a little more challenging to um, keep in the population. Younger males are known for taking walkabouts when they're, when they're sub adults. What we can't move around is uh, older females who've established a home range. The older the bear, the harder, harder that is. So, so it's been pretty effective. Uh, the thing to note about that, it's, um, it's not an easy, simple solution that you can just, oh, let's move bears in there and fix things, the, uh, they, they've moved uh, up, almost up to 20 bears over the last five or 10 years into the cabinets, but only a few of them survive over the long haul to reproduce. So you have to have a very healthy population to move from, a source population, because you're gonna lose a few bears along the way. The good news is we have a lot of very healthy populations in British Columbia that can sustain that kind of a, a uh, helping of a neighbor population, if you will, maybe not necessarily, they didn't agree to that, but um, uh, so, you know, we have a decent situation where it could be considered. I think it used to be on the table for the North Cascades. It got the kibosh put on it for a variety of reasons, but it might come up in the future. And I know the States is considering uh, um, translocating bears uh, there and it might work. And so it, it's, uh, you have to take, when you embark on a program, you have to think about it pretty hard and realize and have a good source population. And, and then also the really important here, I think probably the most important thing is to make sure that you solve the conservation pressures that were on that population that ran it extinct in the first place. If you have, uh, if you might've had too many people in the back country killing bears or whatever it might be, you do need to solve those problems. So the bears you put in there have the best chance of survival. That, That'd be the last point I'd want to say about that. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Thanks Michael, sorry. Um, uh, Michelle, I'm jumping over to you next for this um, next one around some of the data that we have for bears is, uh, comes from the, the uh, DNA studies that have been done. 
and um, a lot of those are sourced from the hair. Um, so what data can you get from just a bear's hair? Um, and then can you tell us a little bit about what you use that information for? Okay, um, you can get a, a lot of, lots of different types of uh, information from bear hairs, but more if you get it from the hair of many different bears, because then you can get population information. So the three most common things done with hair is to get individual ID, so you can identify which bear it is um, with its DNA. And then using the DNA, you get the individual, you get uh, genetic sort of up, you know, loci, which are different areas on that have different genes. And using those, you can get a pedigree or an information on how the bears in a population are related to one another. You can get how populations are related to one another. So population A and population B, how much mixing you get between those two populations. You can get the sex of individuals. So you can get sex ratios. You can get dispersal of some individuals that move into other populations if you capture them in, in different areas or if, if populations are separate enough, they, they have sort of a distinct, um, let's say, pattern, like for lack of a better word, in the, in the different alleles you'll see for different um, genetic loci. And then other things you can get are isotopes, which are isotopes are different uh, nuclear, sort of, um, different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. And because they exist, different ones exist in different patterns. So carbon will vary in different, uh, in different plants and differently. And then nit nitrogen will accumulate heavier atoms as they go up the trophic food chain. And so if you use different ratios of isotopes, you can get information on what the bears are eating, the proportion of their diet that comes from meat or that comes from plants or even and that sort of thing. And then some more recently, people have been looking at levels of uh, hormones in hair. And it's not quite as uh, accurate as, say, DNA. You can really get a good identification on an individual that's very um, accurate. Whereas hormones, you can get maybe the sex, or not the sex, but the, um, well, the sex, but you get that from DNA. But you can also get how old it is, not how old it is exactly, but what age group it's in. So whether it's a juvenile or whether it's re reach reproductive maturity to, I mean, it's about 70% accurate, I think. Uh, what else can you get from hair? Anybody else think of anything on the top of their heads? Alana? <laughs> I just want to say that um, the use of DNA through the roots of the bear hair has revolutionized our studying of grizzly bears in so many ways, and it's even allowed us to do non-invasive techniques, and it was invented by, or found out by Bruce McCollin, who's on this panel, and, and John Lloyds um, yep. with input later from Proctor, and um, yeah, it's, I just wanted to give accolades where they're due there. It's amazing what we can do with DNA and bear hair. Yeah, my, that was Michael's first job, I think. We had him figuring out how to get the hair off the bears. <laughs> but uh, uh, you can also get stress hormones a bit, you know, uh, cortisols and things like that. So, you know, you can compare populations which have different levels of stress, I think, too. It's rarely done. Uh, we've done it with caribou uh, and it uh, had mixed results. And it'd be hard to tease out various stresses, you think. Exactly. One thing that we've done with hair recently is we've looked at the reproductive, reproductive success of certain of females in a population just because we've sampled the whole population so we know how many offspring are actually succeeding and then we're able to go back and relate that to habitat and sort of have a fitness layer like what habitats are related to producing successful offspring. That's been a really cool thing. The other aspect of, of DNA, this whole DNA revolution that's really been neat for Bruce and I, because he started out in radio telemetry and moved into genetics. And I started out in genetics and moved into radio telemetry. But when you start, when you combine the two, you really start to see grizzly bear ecology and all this stuff in color. 
um, because with radio telemetry, you learn a lot about one bear and what it does. And sometimes a lot of bears because you get a lot of collars. But with DNA, we learn a lot about populations and whole different things. They really complement each other. So it's been a really, for my career, it's been a really great thing that I bumped into Bruce 25 years ago. And he had this idea. I just came along and, and did it, but it was really his idea. But it really um, has been cool to do both techniques and really start to see bears in color. And we're really starting to understand what's happening. It's been a satisfying time to be a bear biologist in that regard. Thank you, guys. So I'm just watching the time. So I think we've got time for one more quick one. Um, so, um, Michelle, we're going to um, finish with you talking about um, so often. There's the hair studies, but quite often you still might need to capture a bear for research. And, and so when a grizzly bear is locked out, um, we had a question around how long, um, how long is, it, uh, is a grizzly bear out when you uh, capture them for studies? Um, you can, re with some drugs, you can reverse them right away. But if you don't, they're usually out for about two hours. But often they'll wake up and then move and then go back to sleep for a while and kind of recuperate, I think. Um, they sometimes can stay out for much longer and sort of transition into just sleeping. So for example, if we captured a bear and we went back to check on it either that evening or the following morning and it's still sleeping there, but as soon as you show up with the helicopter, it runs away. So it, it just went from being immobilized chemically to just sleeping. But usually if you catch it in a snare, it'll start waking up within an hour, an hour and a half sort of timing. And an hour and a half is the same length of time as this webinar and so <laughs> we're sticking to it. So um, I, I think what's uh, interesting with doing this virtual format is um, you can see how uh, interested and engaged an audience is by watching the attendance numbers and our attendance numbers have, have barely changed. So it's been really great to um, you know, everybody's obviously really interested, which is fantastic and really wants to thank everybody for um, who's on the call for for spending the evening with us. Um, and I also uh, really want to thank uh, all of you, Bruce, uh, Michael, Michelle and Lana for your time and your insights. It's been really fun to virtually moderate you <laughs> um, and uh, and go through these lists of uh, questions. I'm going to hand back over to um, Jolene, who's going to talk really briefly and just close us out here and flag some of the resources that we've all kind of collectively um, put together um, for people who want to get more information. So um, thank you and back over to you, Jolene. Okay, so yes, cannot thank all of you enough, all of our panelists for sharing all of your expertise, um, but for everyone joining in. And so there was, you know, there was comments um, continuously going through the, the um, chat feed. Um, and, you know, we only had 90 minutes, we couldn't get to all of them, but we are um, grateful for your input, for you submitting them. And um, this is being recorded, so once we get it um, kind of all finalized, um, you'll get that link and it will have the resources in the last, um, I think there's a couple of more slides and it has a few of the resources that um, we are hoping to share with you. I mean, there is a lot of information out there, um, but you know, find credible resources. So um, you know, some of the research uh, Michael has been doing with Transborder Grizzly Bear Project, um, Southwest BC Grizzly Bear Project is Michelle McClellan's, um, and you know, there's there's different um, organizations out there that are dedicated to bears, dedicated to preventing conflict with bears, and these are just some of them. Um, some of them, you know, local communities have their own bear aware groups or, or various um, environmental organizations. So get in touch with them, find out what kind of programs they have, what kind of resources they have. Um, but yeah, we really encourage everyone to do, you know, do their research, get as informed as you can. And with things like this, if, if you did learn something interesting and new, you know, share that knowledge with, with people, with, with your neighbors, with, with anybody who will listen to you. Um, so it's, you know, once we kind of are all on the same page, you know, it's great to hear from the experts, but, you know, with continued research and you do your homework, you can, you know, become an expert too and, and learn all of the things that you um, can to prevent conflicts, to, you know, preserve grizzly bears, to preserve wildlife and habitats, um, things like that. So yeah, there's um, websites, there's literature, there's videos you can watch, there's tons of information out there. 
um, which just a little side sample here, but we will be providing more resources when we send out the link to this, um, this, organ this event that we put on. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in to Claire for her wonderful moderating, um, for all of our panelists and for you know support from the Grizzly Bear Foundation. Again, thank you very much. Um, thank you for participating to everyone and we really do hope you enjoyed it. It was supposed to be fun, um, full of information, interactive, and it is a, a different time, but we, I think it was, we were able to work through it. So yes, again. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a great evening from wherever you're tuning into.